All right, so I titled this morning's message, again, one week before Christmas, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. Um, and we're going to be covering, we're going to be going through several different passages, so um, if you can keep up, that's great. If you don't, if you have your Bibles with you, I'll be, I won't be, I'll tell you where you're going to need to be at, but I know the first one's going to be in, in Matthew chapter 1, and the second one's going to be in Luke, so if you want to keep book markers there, um, you can. All right. Now, I haven't shared this story in several years, but um, I, I think it's, it's worth re- repeating this year um, today. So, and it goes like this. There's a story about Christmas called The Christmas Truce. I don't know, if, again, if you've heard it, but I want to share it with you. World War I had begun only months before, and the fighting on the Western Front between the Germans and the Allies was very fierce. Hope for a quick war was gone. Both armies knew they would be bitter enemies for years. A system of trenches separated the two sides, with the area in between regarded as no man's land. But on Christmas Eve, an unofficial truce began. began. German soldiers began singing Silent Night in German, and men on the other side of the Great Divide joined along in English. Soldiers who were hours before had been attempting to kill one another were now singing together about the wonder of Christ's birth. As the night and the singing continued, the soldiers emerged out of their trenches to join one another in no man's land where they exchanged gifts, shared in burial services, and played soccer together. An estimated 100,000 soldiers along the Western Front laid down their weapons all that night and the next day. In subsequent years, their commanders would demand that they they continue fighting on Christmas Day. But in this one sacred interlude in 1914, a reminder of the incarnation caused a ceasefire, even if for a brief moment there was peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Story here, this wonderful, beautiful story, and I think I've seen a Coke commercial about it too, but kind of waters it down, waters it down because it's a Coke commercial. But um, this true story reveals how Jesus is the common thread that unites all believers. Even if they are on opposite opposite ends of a battlefield. There were a lot of sincere Christian German soldiers and there were a lot of sincere Christian English soldiers. We have to keep that in mind that Maybe people on the other side of the world, in other countries that we may not agree with, governments that we may not agree with, but in those countries we have brothers and sisters who are also going to be celebrating along with us the birth of our Savior. So you see, one of the greatest beauties of the gospel is the way that it welcomes all believers, regardless of race, nationality, language, social status, economic background, or just young, old, and it welcomes them all into the Christian family. All of you, because of Jesus, are part of a family, all of us. And that's what's so great about it, is that we come from different backgrounds, Had it not been for Jesus, had it not been for what Jesus did on the cross and the commitment we've made to him, I'm not sure if any one of us would be able to really get along with one another. But we've been given a spirit that unites us and keeps us together as a bond, the bond of, of, of the Holy Spirit keeps us all united. Well, 
on this Sunday, exactly one week before Christmas. We're going to be spending a little bit of time or some time looking into the events surrounding the birth of Jesus, the birth of our Savior. We're first going to be seeing it through the perspective of Joseph and then Mary. Then I will try to share with you the significance of his birth. And as I mentioned in the beginning, that's what I've been really focusing on here these past couple of weeks. And then lastly, I'll explain in a different way, as I, a different way than I have in the past couple of weeks, why Jesus is God's greatest gift to mankind. So we, before we get into our first passage, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us through his word. Lord Jesus, we are, or Lord God, thank you. Thank you for sending Jesus to be our Savior. I want to thank you, Father in heaven, that you have called all these men and women who are here, all those watching and listening, that you've called them all into a family, that we're all brothers and sisters. You've united us through your spirit. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done this past year. We thank you for all you will continue to do. Continue to shape and mold us into the people you want us to be. May we continually be reminded not just throughout this week, but just through our entire lives, the significance and importance of Jesus' birth. That was that it's just as significant as his death. Because had your son not been born, Lord, we would be just lost and doomed. So thank you. So I ask you to speak powerfully through your word. May it penetrate hearts and minds, and may it produce fruit, Lord, beautiful fruit. Fill this room with your spirit as we sit now at your feet and hear your word. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so I'm going to begin this morning by having us first look at the birth of Jesus through the eyes of Joseph. So, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. And the Word of God says, The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. When I found out that Robin told me, I didn't find out, she told me, that she was pregnant with our first son, freaked out. And she will tell you that I did. Well, I mean, I took the news and I was like, yeah, I always wanted to be a dad and I thought it was going to be cool and exciting. I thought it was going to be one of those cool dads who's going to let their kids do, you know, whatever they want. And I was just going to do it with them. You know, I was just, you know, always thought I was going to be that dad. I was going to be hanging out with their son at the bar and, you know, smoking all kinds of stuff and, and, you know, just partying with him. But then when she told me she was pregnant, I was like, oh man, I don't know if I'm ready to be 
a dad. I was scared. I was scared about just whether I was going to be responsible enough. I was scared if I was going to be good enough. I didn't see myself in a... I, th- I was still a kid. I was only 22, I believe 24, when I had my first son. And I was still so immature, still so much growing up to do. And then I realized, man, I'm not going to be responsible for this other human being. And the thought of it, the weight of it all suddenly came crashing down on me. And in a sense, I kind of wigged out. And as a result, I caused a lot of issues. And I think in a sense, I was trying to run away from that responsibility, but I was also sabotaging now, my, doing things to sabotage my relationship with Robin. And anyways, she would tell you some of the things that I, I did, and I won't get all into the details, but I was scared. I think a lot of fathers maybe not react like I did, but I think a lot of fathers have a, a, a fear. New fathers, brand new fathers have a fear of, you know, are they going to be a good dad? Are they going to live up to, you know, being a a responsible father? I didn't want to be like my dad, and so that was an added pressure. It was rough, and it was tough, that, that just announcement. Now, I was scared for selfish reasons, but Joseph, Joseph's fear, however, was completely different. Now, let me give you some historical and cultural, some cultural context here so you really understand what's going on. At that time, marriages were arranged for individuals by parents and contracts were negotiated. After this was accomplished, the individuals were considered married and were called husband and wife. They didn't, however, live together. Instead, the the woman would continue to live with her parents and the man with his for one year. The waiting period demonstrated Uh, was to demonstrate the faithfulness of the pledge of purity given concerning the bride. (coughs) If she was found to be with child in this period, she obviously wasn't pure, but had been involved in an unfaithful sexual relationship. And therefore, if that happened, the marriage would then be annulled. The contract was voided, and each would go their own separate way. If, however, the one-year waiting period demonstrated the purity of the bride, the husband would then go to the house of the bride's parents and in a grand processional march lead his bride back to his home. There, they would begin to live together as husband and wife and would consummate their marriage physically. Well, there, in that first, in that one-year waiting period, Mary was found to be with child. This, as I said, was a huge problem because Joseph was an honorable man. It says here he was a righteous man, a righteous man. And, and so he hadn't been intimate with her. He hadn't, had, he hadn't consummated, consummated the marriage. And her, she had been faithful. She had been waiting that whole year, faithfully, uh, being faithful to him. And in a bit, I'll share with you the story that happened to her. But now he comes to find out that she's pregnant. Now, there's no doubt in my mind that Joseph genuinely, genuinely, genuinely loved Mary. 
And so you can imagine how heartbreaking this would have been for him. This news would have been for him. What? What do you mean you're pregnant? With who? What's going on? What's happening? Devastating. You see, the moment she said to him, I'm pregnant, he could have chosen to let his bitter feelings or his confused feelings or his negative feelings in general to get the best of him and then go out and charge her with immorality. But he didn't. In spite of that devastating news, he continued to love her by demonstrating it with his actions. What did he do? He chose not to create a public scandal by exposing her condition to the judges at the city gate. So yes, he was scared, but he was scared for her. He was thinking about her well-being. He was thinking about her reputation. Again, men had a different standing at the time, and they all, everyone knew that he was an honorable man, that it was, he was concerned about her because he really loved her. He really cared for her. He was watching out for her, her reputation. And young girls, ladies, that's also the kind of guy you want to be looking for. Someone that's honorable, someone that's good, someone that's well known by their character. And that's going to be looking out for your best interests. It's going to be care, that's going to care about what people think of you and pe- how people see you. Yes, that's what he was doing. He was concerned for her. He was in fear for her. He didn't want her to be known as some floozy. He was just sleeping around. I never used that word before, floozy, but... Um, you guys know what I'm talking about. Again, he chose to do uh, not to create a public scandal. Now, such an act could have resulted in the act of, of you know, having you know, relations outside of her marriage. It could have re- resulted in death by stoning, according to Deuteronomy chapter 22. But instead, he had mercy. Joseph had mercy and chose instead to divorce her quietly. Now, this here is what makes Joseph so likable. He was a moral man who stood for rightness. Now, the fact that he was moral and merciful, it really is a rare combination because if you think about it, if you really think about it, most people or one or the other. Either they're moral or merciful. I'm not saying everybody, but most people. Either they're moral or they're merciful. So men, husbands, fathers, this is something that we ought to be asking God for. You ought to be asking God to make us like Joseph, both moral and merciful. Now, Joseph didn't yet know the true explanation of Mary's condition. And so he, again, gently and deliberately mapped out his strategy to protect Mary. And then... We read, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. The salutation, Joseph, son of David, doubtless was doubtless designed to stir up the consciousness of his royal pedigree and to prepare him for the unusual advent of Israel's Messiah King. And that message pretty much was that he shouldn't have any misgivings about marrying Mary. Those are important words there in uh, verse 20. Don't be afraid. 
And so any suspicions concerning her purity were groundless. Her pregnancy was a miracle of the Holy Spirit. Again, we read there in verse 18 that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. The angel then revealed the unborn, unborn child's sex, his name, and what his mission was going to be was going to be. Mary would bear a son. He was to be named Jesus. And if you're curious about what Jesus means, it means Jehovah is salvation or Jehovah the Savior. And true to his name, he would save his people from their sins. This child of destiny, this baby of destiny was Jehovah himself visiting earth to save people from the penalty of sin, from the power of sin, and eventually from the very presence of sin. Well, once he accepted God's purpose, Joseph took his role as Jesus' adoptive father seriously by living obediently, responsibly, and audaciously. Despite the circumstances and ramifications, Joseph obeyed God's plan. The circumstances, ramifications, again, people were talking. And he was going to, again, people weren't going to understand really what happened. He can explain it till he was blue in the face, and she could explain it, but no one's going to believe it. Most of the people aren't going to believe it. So, they're just gonna, people are just going to think that she was, he was going to marry a woman who was pregnant from another, from another guy. And he just would have to live with that. But again, his goal, what he wanted to do was obey God's plan. Again, verse 24 says, When Joseph got up from sleeping, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. So we see with Joseph, he took care of his responsibilities as a husband, as a father, but as a husband and as a citizen of Rome. As a husband, verse 24 and 25 also tells us that he eventually married Mary and he wasn't intimate with her. And as a citizen, Luke chapter 2, verses 4 and 5 says that he traveled some distance with Mary to be registered. So despite the enormous challenges that confronted him, Joseph audaciously persevered until he found a place his wife could give birth. And I'm jumping ahead just a little bit in the story, but he would do that for her. So you see, in other words, Joseph never wavered in the face of adversity. When he was out looking for a place for her to give birth, he kept looking, kept asking. He didn't give up. Fathers, dads, husbands, are you the same way? Are you going to keep going? Never give up on your children. Never give up on your spouse. Keep trying. Keep working. Both of you. It's not going to always be easy. But you keep going. Keep working hard. Allow the Lord to be that glue. Allow Him to be your guys' crutch during those difficult times. But as a father also, you do whatever you can for your kids. Don't be selfish. Go, you know, you want to go until the, the ends of the world to help them out. Not to do everything for them, but to help them out. To assist them. Because this life, you know this life isn't going to be easy. So you teach them, you guide them. But again, importantly here, what's important is that he never gave up. As hard as it was, 
as difficult, even when everyone said no, we have no room, he never gave up. When there was no room, he found room. Well, after the birth of Jesus, Joseph demonstrated his love and his commitment by doing what was necessary to protect his family. After being told in a dream that he needed to leave Bethlehem, he didn't hesitate and immediately did what he was told. So with nothing but the possessions they had with them, Joseph, he takes his family and he, they journey 75 miles south to Egypt's border. Joseph, he did what he had to do to protect what he loved. Although it wasn't biologically his child, he loved Jesus. He loved him as though he were. And ladies and gentlemen, church, all of you have a father in heaven who does the same with you. He may not be your biological father, but he loves you all the more, even more than your real biological father. As some of you might have had really bad fathers, and the, the issue with that is a lot of people think that God the Father there in heaven is the same, is going to have that same attitude as those fathers, but that's further from the truth. Your Father in heaven loves you tremendously, loves you so much, He will always be there for you. And He created you. He formed you. He knew about you even before you were born. He knows every fiber of your being. And He loves you. He loves every aspect. He doesn't love the sin aspect. But he loves every aspect of, of you because He formed you. He created you. Remember that. Even when your relationships with your fathers aren't going well, you have a father who wants, who will be there, will always be there for you. He loves you, cares for you. All right, now, I, what I want to do now is look at these events through the eyes of Mary. So now let's go to Luke, Luke chapter 1. And I'm going to begin in verse 26, Luke chapter 1, verse 26. And now this is her account, her story. We, read, we just read about, what, about Joseph's account, what happened to him. Now we're going to be reading about Mary. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the, and the angel came to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. Then the angel told her, again, familiar words, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary asked the angel, How can this be? Since I've not had any, since I've not had sexual relations with a man, the angel replied to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Church, we see here in these verses that Mary remained faithful and obedient through her own trials and difficulties. We see in this passage that, and in the former passage, that Joseph, he struggled. He initially struggled 
with the news that Mary gave him. But here now, well, again, she knew that by telling him that she was pregnant, she was not only risking losing a, a good man, an honorable man, a moral man, a merciful man, but she was also risking losing a promising future. And she was also risking probably her life. Then you have the issue of being misunderstood by her community. She probably lost a lot of friends and maybe even family members who put her to shame for her, for her obedience. She was rejected and scorned, had her integrity and purity doubted, and judged harshly for simply obeying God. Throughout this experience, Mary trusted and submitted to God and her husband. After the angel told her that she would conceive and give birth to a son, Mary's response in verse 38 reveals her willingness, her sincere willingness to submit to God. And there she, said, there she says, I am the Lord's slave, servant. May it be done to me according to your word. Now it also appears that Mary willfully submitted to her husband, Joseph. In the stories that we that I just covered in Matthew and also in Luke, nothing indicates that she argued or objected to any of the decisions he made during or after the birth. Imagine, for a second, women being told by your husband you're pretty much about to, or you have a newborn baby, that you're going to have to travel 90, 75, 90 miles, or, yeah, on foot, 90 miles on foot, and on a donkey to Bethlehem. Or let me maybe put in, give you another just. Imagine if your husband told you, hey, we're going to travel 90 miles and you're going to have to ride on a little foot scooter while I push it, you know. So would you? I don't know. I don't think any, any pregnant woman would. Unless, again, she was submissive to her husband. You see, she accept, accepted her role as Joseph's wife because she understood that by honoring him, by honoring her husband, she was also honoring God. Women, wives, are you thinking the same thing? Is that, does that go through your mind? You know what, I may not like this decision my husband has made this family decision that's probably going to affect our future. But he's the leader. God has appointed him as the leader of this family. And I will honor him because I honor God. Now, men, you have a big responsibility. You've been called to that responsibility as a husband, as a father, as the leader of that family. And so you better take that, that, that role seriously because you will be held accountable. You will be held accountable for your family that God gave you for you to lead. Again, she was obeying him because she was honoring God. She was honoring him. She was also honoring God. And Mary continued to believe that her yes was to Almighty God and that this child would be worth it. This child would be absolutely worth it. It would be worth all of it. As Christians, we know that Mary was an important part of our faith story. But who she but who she was birthing was the most important person of all. 
our focus on her story is really all about her son, Jesus. And that's what I want to focus on next is the next aspect of Jesus' birth. The next aspect of Jesus' birth we're going to be looking at is the significance of his birth. Have you ever wondered what would have happened if Jesus hadn't been born? Well, I tell you right off the, right off the bat, there wouldn't be any apostles. There wouldn't be Christianity, and it wouldn't be a church. Let me read to you a passage. You can go there if you'd like, but I'll be reading it um, here. It's in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and here in verse 11, beginning in verse 11, we're gonna, it's going to be describing what his birth accomplished. Hebrews, I mean, sorry, Rome, Ephesians chapter, <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. So then, remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcised by those called the circumcised, which is done in the flesh by human hands. At that time, you were without Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenants of promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. In his flesh he made of no effect the law consisting of commands and, and expressed in regulations so that he might create in himself one new man from the two, resulting in peace. He did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross by which he put the hostility to death. He came and proclaimed the good news of peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For though, for through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you who are no, so then you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. His birth, that's what his birth accomplished, my friends. This passage in this passage, not only did God create a new body, He's creating a new building built upon, built upon the foundation of the message of the apostle and prophets. And that message is Jesus Christ. He is the chief cornerstone. But guess what? The building isn't done. He has created a new man. But he is creating a new building. Why? Because it's growing. Friends, if Jesus hadn't been born, we wouldn't know what God is like. From the beginning of human history, we've been hungry. Humanity has been hungry to know who God is. And God revealed what he is really like by sending his son. That's why Isaiah wrote that God became Emmanuel, God with us. Otherwise, God would have no face, no ears, no heart that we could understand because as Jesus said, anyone who has seen me, anyone who has seen me 
has seen the Father. Jesus said that in John 14, 9. And in John 10, 30, he said, I and the Father are one. Church, if Jesus hadn't come on Christmas, we would have no knowledge of what God is like. We wouldn't understand how He could identify with us and how we could relate to Him. If Jesus hadn't been born, there would be no forgiveness of sins. Without the birth of Jesus, there is no perfect sacrifice for sin. If there's no sacrifice, there's no atonement. If there's no atonement, there's no forgiveness. And if there's no forgiveness, there's no fellowship with God. And if there's no fellowship with God, there is no eternal life. Let me repeat that so it sinks in. There hadn't been, if Jesus hadn't been born, there would be no forgiveness of sin. Without the birth of Jesus, there would be no perfect sacrifice for sin. If there is no sacrifice, there's no atonement. If there's no atonement, there's no forgiveness. If there's no forgiveness, there's no fellowship with God. If there's no fellowship with God, there is no eternal life. Let that sink in again. But guess what? Jesus was born. He was born. And His birth was extraordinary. It was extraordinary because of all the Old Testament prophecies concerning His birth, Now, because of his, it was extraordinary because of the Old Testament prophecies concerning his birth. I needed to repeat that because I didn't want it. I want what I'm about to say makes sense. See, scholars estimate that there are between 15 to 20 Old Testament prophecies written about the birth of Jesus. I spoke about this a little bit last week, but mathematically speaking, the odds of one person fulfilling eight prophecies is one in a quadrillion. It was extraordinary because Jesus was born according to God's perfect timing. It says in Ephesians 4, verses 4 and 7, But when the right time came, God sent His Son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent Him to buy, God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that He could adopt us as His very own children. You see, prior to Jesus' birth, God laid the foundation through the Jewish law to help people understand the depth of their sinfulness so that they may readily accept the cure for that sin through Jesus, the Messiah. So in other words, again, He was born. Prior to when He was born, Jesus, the God laid down the law. He gave us the law. He gave people the law so that they understand what sin is. So that once they understand it, they could say, hey, yeah, you know what? I'm a sinner. I've messed up. I can't keep the law. I need someone or some, I need, I need a savior. And so once they come to that understanding, they can see Jesus and say, yeah, He is that Savior. Have you come to that place, my friends? Now, it was extraordinary. It was also extraordinary because everything that happened after Jesus' birth. Both Matthew and Luke tell us of the miraculous events that occurred when Jesus was born. Everything from the host of the angels pronouncing his birth to the wise men laying their gifts before him. Jesus' birth was an absolutely phenomenal event. Absolutely. With the time I have left, I want to cover one final aspect of this story that I, again, hope that you consider uh, during this Christmas week. That is that Jesus' birth was the greatest gift to mankind. As I mentioned, I 
covered a little bit of this, a few these topics uh, past couple weeks, but let me give you a different spin or the same kind of spin, but a little different. God gave us the gift of his son. In the beginning of John's gospel, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. So you see, before anything and everything was created, Jesus Christ existed with God the Father and the Holy Spirit. So God sending Jesus to us in a way that He did showed us, it shows us how much He loves us and how much He wanted and desired for us to know Him. Again, quoting from Jesus. And many of you are familiar with this, these two verses in John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world in this way. He gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world that He might condemn the world, but that, that the world might be saved through Him. So you see, God's, God's gift to humanity, His ultimate gift, it didn't come in a palace of gold, but in a stable, wrapped in rags, and resting comfortably in a feeding trough. Through His Son, God has given us the gift of grace and forgiveness. This week, as you celebrate with family and friends, and you know, as you're there around that fire, around that tree, or just talking good times, consider the true meaning of Christmas. The true meaning of Christmas is that because Jesus came to save people from their sins, all who put their trust in Him, all who put their trust in Him can be in a right relationship with God. <coughs> is that what you want? Is that what you desire to have a right relationship with God the Father, God, the God of the universe, the creator of heaven and earth? Again, that relationship was broken because of what occurred there in the Garden of Eden because of what first man and woman did. And ever since then, because of sin, our relationship with Him has been fractured. But now, it can be made right. You can enjoy living a meaningful and brightful and vibrant relationship, friendship with Him, culminating in everlasting life with Him in heaven. My friends, God gave us a gift that we didn't deserve. He gave us the gift of His Son when we were His enemies. Think about that. He gave us the gift of His Son when we were enemies of Him, when we were His enemies. He didn't give this gift to us because we deserved it. In fact, just the opposite. We didn't deserve it, but He gave it to us anyways. Listen to what it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God proves His own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let me rephrase that in a more, maybe in a more personal sense to you. 
But God proves His own love for you in that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. Now before I end this morning's service, I want to take a moment to remind you again, reiterate what Christmas is ultimately about. The core message of the Christmas story is that God was born into the world. Everything about Jesus' birth was intended to show us this fundamental truth. And because people have a difficult time grasping the reality that Almighty God could be born as a baby, the true meaning of Christmas is overlooked. Rather than accepting the truth for what it is, it's easier for people to ignore it by burying it underneath the modern-day distractions of Christmas. Yes, I agree. I get it. I, I, I agree that God being born as a baby is a hard, it's a hard thing to, to fathom. But I believe and accept it just as I believe that God created Adam from the dust of the ground. And every single story that seems unfathomable in the Bible, that Jesus would raise a woman's son from the dead. Yes. God being born as a baby, I believe it. And I hope you do too. You see, the Bible tells us that without forsaking His divine nature or diminishing His deity, He was born into our world as a tiny infant. This made Him fully human with all the needs and emotions that are common to all of us. And yet... He was also fully God, all wise and powerful. In one of his table talks, Martin Luther, the reformer, he wrote, the mystery of the humanity of Christ, that he sunk himself into our flesh. Let me repeat that in different contexts the mystery of the humanity of Christ, that He sunk Himself into our flesh, is beyond human understanding. Even He, that theologian, that reformist, He, he knew that it was hard to completely understand. The real Christmas story is a story of God, God's becoming, is a story of God becoming a human being in the person of Jesus Christ. He did this because He loves us, and He knew we needed a Savior. He loved us because who He is. Because He loved us because that's who He is. In John 1, or 1 John chapter 4, verses 9-10, through 10, it says, God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent His one and only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. Love consists in this, not that we loved God, but that He loved us. He sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Not only was God's greatest gift, not only was Jesus God's greatest gift to us, He was the most, He was the most, uh, It was the most, sacrif the most sacrificial thing he possibly could have offered. Don't let that truth slip away from you as you celebrate Christmas. The gift God has given us through his son, Jesus Christ, it's free. It's free and available to anyone who asks for it. However, if that's what you desire, if that's what you want, that free gift, 
He desires two things from you. First, He wants us to trust His Son as Savior and Lord. We come to know Jesus through our repenting of our sin and accepting, accepting Him as our personal sacrifice. When, we, when I talk about Him being your personal Lord and Savior, He has to be your personal Lord and Savior. Not your parents, not your husbands, not your wives, not your grandparents. He wants to be your personal Lord and Savior. Personal. You've got to know Him personally. If you want to know more about Jesus, if you want to have a closer relationship about Jesus, get to know Him, accept Him, surrender yourself to Him. Stop fighting Him. Give yourself over to Him. Let Him change you, transform you. Let Him save you. God wants us to know Him, and we can only know Him through Jesus. Jesus again said this in, five, in John chapter 5, verse 24. I assure you, anyone who hears my word and believes Him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. So again, that's the first thing, to trust Jesus as Savior and Lord. The second thing, God wants us to be conformed in the image of His Son. The Father wants all of His children, all of us, to be conformed into the image of His Son, Jesus. He wants us all to be like His Son. He understands us. He knows that we're not going to be perfect. One day we will be, if He is your Savior, if you are saved. But... He wants us to be transformed more and more as we live this life into the image of Jesus. He brings situations into our lives to refine us and chip away those flawed characteristics that keep us from becoming who He designed us or created us to be. As Jesus was obedient to the Father in everything, so the goal of every child of God should be the same, to obey your Heavenly Father. It says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, So you must live as God's obedient, obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways. Some of you need to hear this again. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. And that's from the New Living Translation. The best gift you can give to God on Christmas Day if you haven't done so already, is the gift of your heart. 19th century poet Christina Rossetti wrote this, well, wrote this short poem, and it was also the idea behind that famous Christmas classic song, The Little Drummer Boy which happens to be one of my favorite Christmas songs. And he wrote this. In between all the parumpa pum pums there in that song, the last half of the song says this. Listen carefully. What can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would give him a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part, but what can I give him? 
I will give him my heart. Little baby, I'm a poor boy too. I have no gift to bring that's fit to give the king. Shall I play for you on my drum? I play my drum for him. So to honor him, Mary nodded. The ox and lamb kept time. I played my drum for him. I played my best for him. That's what he wants from you. Just give him what you can. Give him your heart. So today, one week before Christmas, I want to ask you, have you offered to God what He desires the most from you? If not, will you? Are you ready to? You will accept it. He's not going to abuse your heart. He's not going to He's not like people. He's not going to take advantage of you. He's going to cherish it and take care of your heart. Just as he's done to me, taking care of my heart, as he's done countless number of people who are here. Are you ready to give him your heart? Your heart. You're watching and listening, and you're ready to do that. All you have to do is come to the cross. I'm going to lead you in a prayer to ask Him to forgive you your sins, to be born again. And if you're ready to do that, whether you're, again, you're here, you're watching, listening to this message later on, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. And with all sincerity, Pray this, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness. I'm sorry. I believe you died for my sins, and that three days later you rose from the grave, from the dead. I now turn from my sins, I repent, and I confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. And thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that He may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.